Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more Conversations in the Digital Age. Today we have a terrific show for you on President Trump's foreign policy after the first hundred days. Trump has been consistently inconsistent. One day he wants to make nice with Russia, the next day the opposite. One day NATO is obsolete, the next day it is no longer obsolete. One day he wants to tear up the Iran nuclear treaty, NAFTA or the Paris Climate Change Accord, then he decides to leave them in place. Trump said he wants to stay out of Syria, but launches an airstrike against Assad's air base as he eats chocolate cake on his Mar-a-Lago estate with President Xi of China, a scene smacking of the baptism scene in The Godfather, while his Secretary of Commerce calls the airstrike in which at least seven were killed after dinner entertainment. North Korea hardly a model of rationality, warns that Trump and his tweets are creating a dangerous situation in which a nuclear war may break out at any moment. Next thing, the president wants to meet with North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. When a White House invitation to Rodrigo Duterte, brutal president of the Philippines, responsible for extrajudicial killings of drug dealers and other criminals, follows a kumbaya love fest with Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, military dictator of Egypt, how are supporters of democratic values in the world meant to react to the inconsistency in American leadership? Here possibly to lend clarity to where we are headed is an old friend, Elliot Abrams. Elliot Abrams is a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. He was the deputy national security advisor in the Bush White House and has held a variety of governmental posts in Republican administrations. He was seriously considered for Deputy Secretary of State under Rex Tillerson in the Trump administration. Elliot, welcome. Thank you. First of all, is Trump's foreign policy, to the extent it can be discerned, at all coherent? Well, I think it is becoming increasingly a Republican foreign policy. If you think of the examples that you used, um, the direction is what I'd call back toward uh, more traditional Republican foreign policy. It was <clears throat> NATO was obsolete, but now the view is no, NATO is good, and he met with the Secretary General. Same thing on NAFTA, uh, not junking it. The JCPOA deal with Iran. <clears throat> you look at all these, I think where they have ended up at the end of 100 days is fairly standard Republican foreign policy. Presidents are largely judged on whether they bring us peace, prosperity, and security. Do you think... Uh uh, after 100 days, uh, the Trump administration is headed in that direction? I do think so. I think I'm not really an expert on the prosperity part. Um, but it is. Oh, we'll carve prosperity. Yeah, out. the hell we'll, we'll, prosperity is right. People will be poor, but at least they'll be secure in <laughs> right. peace. Um, yeah, I think he's moving in that direction. He seems to be taking advice, in my view, from McMaster, Tillerson, Mattis, Pompeo, Kelly. These are the top foreign and national security guys. And they're a pretty good team, I would think, and a team that might have served really any Republican president. So at the end of 100 days, my sense is it's heading in the right direction on foreign policy, with the exception that you noted, which is the democracy, human rights, values aspect. Is predictability, consistency, and foreign policy a virtue? Well, we get back to, you know, the Nixon idea. It's good if they think I'm crazy. Um, but I would say, yes, it is, uh, because not only are your enemies listening, your friends are listening. Uh, they need to know where you're headed. The Jap if, if we're talking about uh, North Korea, the Japanese, Australians, South Koreans, and so on, Taiwanese. If it's the Middle East, it's the Saudis, Emiratis, Israelis, Jordanian. They need to know more or less what you think. So predictability is a virtue. Well, if uh, you were to give uh, 
Trump. Foreign policy advisors a prescription uh, for uh, the way forward. Uh, would you uh, have them say something like, uh, Mr. President, you've got to stop all these gyrations and come up with uh, some central theme? I think it would be better if he spoke with a script. That is, stop tweeting. Because um, the speeches he's given have been okay, the prepared remarks. Um, and the well, not the America First speech and the America is a Carnage speech. This was uh, the, that, was oh, that was just the inaugural that's, address. <laughs> that's just how he got started. Um, but I think the foreign policy speeches have basically uh, been okay since then. And the remarks basically that he has made when meeting with foreign leaders uh, have been okay as well. And again, I think because they're more or less uh, scripted. Uh, now, he has dialed back in certain areas from things he, he said mm -hmm. during the campaign. Maybe they were just campaign rhetoric, but uh, he's uh, backed away from lifting sanctions on Russia. He's backed away on moving the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, he seems to have abandoned uh, his abandonment of the one China policy. Right. Uh, tearing up the Iran nuclear agreement. Right. Uh, do you feel that, uh, you know, maybe he is listening to advice he's getting yeah. from experts? Well, I think it's two things. Number one, it's advice from pretty good people. Uh, secondly, I would say um, the information level. Don't forget, uh, we've all been saying this is the first president ever who had no military or political experience, never held office before. Quite right. So his level of information is massively higher after 100 days of meetings, briefings. You know, he's met Xi Jinping. He's met Abe. He's met Theresa May. He's met Netanyahu. He's met, you can go down the list. You know, these are conversations that last between one and three hours. He's met CC. He's offered to meet Duterte, but he was snubbed. Uh, he'd like to <laughs> meet with Kim Jong-un. Well, he didn't say he'd like to. He said this, he was this willing This is a man to. who likes meetings. That's the art uh, of the deal. But that's, you know... Part of this is judging who's across the table from you, um, which is a good thing. So I just think it's good advice, but it's also um, knowing a lot more than he knew on January 20th or, or November 8th. Well, let's take uh, step two, uh, a gentleman known as Steve Bannon. Now, uh, Steve Bannon was a, a key figure uh, in the White House. He was given a seat on the National Security Council within the first 100 days. Now it seems to be like uh, reality uh, television. The Apprentice, he's been uh, uh, pushed back. Maybe he'll be thrown off the island. Uh, you think it was a good move to, to get Bannon off the National Security Council? Yeah, that was critical. Why, why do you say that? I was in the George W. Bush administration, and he loved Karl Rove, who had gotten him elected president. And Rove was told, don't ever go to any of these NSC meetings. Don't ever set foot in the in the Situation Room, because you have to demonstrate to the American people that life and death foreign policy decisions, military decisions even, are being made without reference to your domestic political advantage. I don't think there's any precedent for having someone who is doing what Bannon is doing be a member of the NSC and also the National Security Council um, Principals Committee, which is the cabinet members. Now, that's been turned around, too. That's a reversal. And it's a very good one because it was, I think, a big mistake. Now, you think Bannon has been marginalized in the White House? Well, you know, it's very hard to tell. Uh, we're on the outside and we're trying to figure out who's up, who's down. It's Kremlinology. Certainly the president gave him a big brushback uh, a couple of months ago when he said, you know, he didn't get me elected. I got me elected. He came in the campaign very late, you know. I think the president doesn't like to see other people, you know, on the cover of Time and taking credit for the administration's achievements. And Bannon, who should have known better, made that mistake. Now, uh, you had a uh, uh, collision uh, with uh, Bannon yourself because uh, Rex Tillerson uh, wanted you to be his deputy secretary of state, uh, mm -hmm. second most powerful <clears throat> person in the State Department. Uh, Tell us what happened. What, what, what's the inside baseball on that? Well, I'm not 100% sure. I can tell you that um, Tillerson selected me um, on February 7th, I guess it was. We went to see the president. And you had backing from a number of leading Republicans. And even some Democrats. Yeah. 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 I mean, and it seemed like a done deal, and, and the meeting went quite well. Um, and it, everyone thought, I mean, Tillerson did, Jared Kushner did, White House Chief of Staff 
Heinz Priebus did. This was done, but then it was undone that night. Um, and it's unclear to me exactly what role Bannon played and what role, frankly, Rand Paul played, because he had that very day done a vicious uh, op-ed attacking me um, with a variety of falsehoods about, about uh, for example, calling me an architect of the war in Iraq. But so I can't, you Which know. Which war in Iraq were you the yeah, architect of? I guess it was the second <laughs> the war in second. Iraq. Um, so, uh, or maybe both, who knows, you know, in his, in his mind. Um, so I can't tell you the exact, then this happened, you know, the TikTok. Um, but at, you know, three o'clock, it was great. And at whatever, eight, nine o'clock, it was not great. Uh, let's uh, shift to the Middle East, maybe a, a more palatable topic for you. Uh, the uh, uh, Russia, Turkey, Iran, Syria uh, just concluded uh, some talks in uh, Kazakhstan and Astana. Uh, the United States was conspicuously absent. Yeah. Uh, basically, the conclusion they came to was uh, to divide uh, Syria into four uh, pacified zones where uh, uh, um, Syrians could take refuge. And this would uh, end the refugee crisis and, uh, and abate perhaps the uh, humanitarian crisis. But uh, the United States had no involvement, no skin mm. in the game. Uh, what do you make of all this? Well, since I'm a Republican, I can blame Obama for everything. Yeah. And I will. <laughs> this is the detritus of the withdrawal. This is the detritus of Obama's refusal to act for all those years of the Syrian civil war to save civilian lives in Syria, to take the advice of Leon Panetta and Hillary Clinton, who said, we need to have safe zones. Now, those safe zones that they talked about in Astana, they don't actually comprise all of Syria. They're mostly in the far north next to Turkey and in the south near Jordan. Um, but it shows you how much the Russians have been able to fill a vacuum, that they're the ones who are convening peace conferences, which is really unheard of for decades now, and particularly in the Middle East, since Sadat threw them out of Egypt. So it is a, it is a sign of the Russian-Iranian influence and partnership. Uh, but you can't read us out because we are, in fact, on the ground in Syria, working particularly with the Syrian Kurds. It is they who are likely, uh, with our help, to take Raqqa from the Islamic State. So this is partly an effort on the part of the Russians to totally marginalize us, and it, that will not work. Do you see a, a, a Kurdish force ever being acceptable to, uh, uh, to the Russians or to the Iranians or to the Turks uh, taking Raqqa? Well, apparently, judging by what I read in the papers, uh, this is the American position. That is that the Kurds are going to have to take the lead in taking Raqqa. And that is because they are actually the most effective fighters against ISIS. I don't think that's a problem for the Russians or even necessarily for Iran. It is a major problem for Erdogan. So that is going to obviously be the top of the agenda for Erdogan and Trump in uh, meetings they have. Now, uh, Trump says he's going to settle Syria with, uh, with Putin when he sits down with Putin. Do you, do you see that as ever happening? No, they won't settle it. I mean, it's immensely complicated and they can't settle it because they are, we are not the only players. Uh, they and we. As you mentioned, uh, Iran and Turkey are there, and Jordan is too, but the Turks in particular, if we have a, you know, a deal that, uh, in their view, elevates the Kurds too much, they're going to reject it. They're going to fight it. So, um, no, this is not something they're going to be able to settle the way, apparently, uh, Churchill and Stalin just drew lines and settled things in and 45. With blood on both sides. Yes. Now, uh, uh, under Obama, as I recall it, <clears throat> Uh, his policy was Assad must go. Do you think that's a sensible U.S. foreign policy now in light of uh, uh, Assad's having solidified his position? I do think so as an ultimate goal. I say that because Assad has killed half a million of his own people, and he is an Alawite, which is a minority of maybe 10, 12 percent of the country. The people he's killing are basically Sunnis. He will never be able to rule that country except through more and more killing and brutality. If we want stability, and presumably the Jordanians, Israelis, Turks, Iraqis do want stability, then in the end he has to go. There cannot be stability with a mass murder of his own population 
running, trying to run the country, a majority Sunni country. Well, it uh, really seems that none of the stakeholders want stability. Turkey doesn't want stability because stability may mean uh, Kurdish primacy. Israel is very happy to see its arch enemy Syria divided and fragmented in civil war. Uh, you know, Russia uh, wants to stir the soup, it seems. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic than that. You know. um, maybe wrongly, but um, <clears throat> I think the Turks clearly don't want the, you know, Kurdistan there. But they also don't want this incredible flow of refugees, is now about a million and a half, whom they would like to send home. The Jordanians would like that too. The Israelis now see, as they look on the other side of the Golan, they see Iranian and Iranian-backed forces and Islamic State forces. So they don't want that. So I, and, and I think the Iraqis is the same. They would like stability there. I think uh, looking forward, it's hard to envision the kind of national government there was in Syria really running the entire country. But I think there is going to have to be some kind of internal deal that creates a soft division. One national government, one flag, but a kind of Alawistan, Kurdistan, Sunnistan um, that allows people more or less local self-government. A balkanization. Uh, but not a formal one. A, a An informal balkanization. One. Well, a, a, a soft and non-legal one. Ah. Now, uh, has U.S. policy uh, towards Syria changed, in your view, since uh, Trump's strike on the uh, Syrian airfield? It hasn't changed since then. I think the policy we're talking about... Well, since Obama, with the Syrian strike. Yeah, I think we are clearly more of a player now. That strike uh, got a lot of attention, and he has also put, I think the number is about 500 more uh, American service people on the ground, mostly special forces, so we're, and we're bombing more. So I think we're more of a player than we were, and that gets us to the table. The error that Kerry made was trying to negotiate peace in Geneva when he hadn't achieved anything on the ground in Syria. And you can never achieve at the conference table what you have not achieved on the battlefield. So I think Trump is trying to get us... That's diplomacy 101. 101. And I think uh, Trump, Mattis, McMaster know that and are trying to get us in a somewhat more advantageous position on the ground. Now, what about Tillerson? Tillerson's had a very low profile in all this, at least uh, the press says. He hasn't been available to them and he hasn't said very much. Uh, do you think this is sensible? Uh, perhaps because uh, so many positions in the State Department have been left unfilled. Well, I think the press has been wrong in one way. They've been saying, well, we don't see him and he won't talk to us, and therefore he is a person of no influence. Whereas, in fact, somebody, I think it was the AP, finally took a look at the president's schedule. He was seeing Tillerson more often than he was seeing any other cabinet member, including Mattis. So Tillerson was clearly someone he liked, uh, trusted, saw a lot of. And I think in, in the meeting I had with Trump, for example, um, he listened to Tillerson. He listened carefully. Uh, it was a very businesslike meeting. Tillerson pushed back once or twice on things the president had said. So I think we've, we've underestimated Tillerson. But I think he's making a mistake not to meet with the press more and use the press. And I think, of course, he's making a mistake not to fill these jobs faster. You know, they're, they're, you're going to run up, you get now nominated. This is Trump's mistake. Why hasn't he filled the job? Well. Is it because so many members of the foreign policy community were against him? Yes. During the campaign? I mean, most members of the Republican foreign policy community supported Jeb Bush, John Kasich, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, you know, the, the, the 10 others. Um, and normally you'd then say, okay, all's well, forgiven and bring them in the way Obama brought Hillary Clinton in. But the administration is saying, okay, if you were. If you didn't support the president, we don't need you. You know, the country's not going to fall apart overnight over this, but it's a mistake because, you know, what happens is all of the people who are filling these jobs, they're not vacant. There's an acting everything. These are career civil servants who are, in my experience, about 95 percent Democrats who would not have voted for him. That's the outcome when you leave all the positions vacant. And presumably it is not what he wanted. Well, is this uh, a a variant of paranoid politics, of McCarthyism? I have here in my hand a folder containing uh, a list of 100 foreign policy experts who said bad things about you during the campaign. Well, isn't McCarthyism? It's, you know, the president, as I said... Paranoid politics. After I was vetoed, uh, I said, look, president gets to choose. You know, nobody has a right to have a uh, big job in the federal government. 
The president gets to choose. He's totally within his rights. But when you do this to the whole Republican foreign policy establishment, you're gratifying Rand Paul. You're gratifying, you're gratifying Steve Bannon. You're gratifying people who say, well, that whole Republican establishment is horrible and out of touch. But then try to run a foreign policy. It's difficult. Difficult without experts. Yeah. People who have a background in the region. And, and who are sympathetic, basically, to a Republican view of foreign policy. And there is such a view. You know, I worked in the Reagan administration for George Shultz. And his rule was he wanted every assistant secretary to be a Republican political appointed who felt some loyalty to the party, the administration, the president. I think that's the right thing to do. And I think the president would find if he reached out that <clears throat> said to people, I'd like to bring you in, the campaign is over, people would say they would like to come in, which is what I've urged people to do, that sort of slim group that has gotten job offers. Let's uh, shift to uh, North Korea, which may be the number one yeah. uh, national security priority uh, in the world. Uh, Trump recently uh, praised Kim Jong-un. He said, and I quote, people are saying, is he sane? I have no idea. I can tell you this, and a lot of people don't like when I say it, but he was a young man of 26 or 27 when he took over from his father, when his father died. He's dealing with obviously very tough people, in particular the generals and others. And at a very young age, he was able to assume power. A lot of people, I'm sure, tried to take that power away, whether it was his uncle or anybody else, and he was able to do it. So obviously he's a pretty smart cookie. But we have a situation that we just cannot let. We cannot let what's been going on for a long period of years continue. And frankly, this should have been done and taken care of by the Obama administration, should have been taken care of by the Bush administration, should have been taken care of by Clinton. Uh, so what do you make of this? Do you think he's right? Well, first, he's right on the kicking the can down the road policy. And I think it's Tillerson and Rick Master has said, you know, we had a policy of strategic patience, which basically means you don't do anything except give them aid and plead with them to go back to the table. And the president's right that the last three administrations, including one in which I serve, have done this. And we've gotten nowhere with the North Koreans, but they get, now they have nuclear weapons and are working very hard on a delivery system. Look, the president is doing something that um, is very uh, discomforting to most of us. He won't criticize foreign leaders. His view seems to be, I would like to talk to them, whether it's Putin or you mentioned Duterte, Sisi. Even, even this guy, who, by the way, has consolidated his hold on power by murdering everyone around him, including his own family members, most recently his uncle. So, in the most bizarre assassination <laughs> on record in history. Uh, they do this, in a, you know, rubbing shoot, poison on his face. That's one way. They shoot people out of cannons. I mean, it's... Anyway, um, he seems to think a lot of this comes down to the ability to talk to people face to face. My experience is that that can be overrated because, generally speaking, people do not act because they like you. They act because they view their national interests as requiring them to move to this place or that place. So I think it's, it's uh, overdone. But I think he's right in saying we've lost a lot of time and we cannot kick the ball down the, the, kick the can down the road anymore. All this has now fallen, let's mix metaphors, it's fallen into his lap. Um, and we don't really have four or eight more years. Now, what you do about it, I, I think he's doing the only, trying the only sensible thing, China. China has been unwilling to put a lot of pressure on. And the question really is, can we push or pull or cajole or pressure them into doing it? If you can't, you really don't have many alternatives but very unpalatable military action. But for the president of the United States to express a willingness to meet with this young thug, uh, I mean, isn't, isn't that uh, really, doesn't that signal weakness? I mean, did you ever, you were in the Reagan administration, did you ever hear Ronald Reagan praise Gorbachev that way, saying he's a pretty smart cookie and uh, a lot of tough people around you him, know, so I, you have to uh, admire him? By the time he got to praising Gorbachev, there was reason to praise, praise him. him. Yeah. Um, but, but not when he uh, said, tear down that wall. Uh, no, but he didn't insult him either. I think there's a, in, particularly in the Kim case, uh, there's a very big argument that uh, you should not meet with him. But I remind you, at the end of the Clinton administration, Madeleine Albright went to Pyongyang, and it was only at the last minute that a Clinton trip, a presidential trip to North Korea, was called off. So he isn't the first, Trump is not the first president to think about talking to the North Koreans. 
Trump may feel, look, um, everything else we've tried has failed. So if China won't do it, we talk to them or, or we bomb it. Well, do you, to talk. do you think there's any way they'd give up their nukes? I mean, Gaddafi gave up his nukes, and what happened to him? He got a bullet in his... I think, yes, I, th I think this is a very important point. For Kim Jong-un to want nuclear weapons and deliverable ones is not a sign of insanity. It's not crazy. If you were in his position, you probably would too, because he has seen exactly this, that, that people without nuclear weapons can be overthrown, but people who have them aren't overthrown. So I think... Um, it's going to be extremely difficult, even with a very uh, helpful China, which we do not yet have, to get him to give up his nuclear weapons. Okay, Elliot Abrams, we've run out of time, but I have a question for you. Is consistency essential to U.S. foreign policy? Or is it the hobgoblin of small minds? <laughs> um, it's, uh, I would argue, a very great virtue in foreign policy. You think it's a virtue in foreign policy? I do. Consistency is a virtue. Ralph Waldo Abrams. There you are. <laughs> Thank you for coming by. This is really marvelous. My and pleasure. Thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more Conversations in the Digital Age. I'm Jim Zirin. All the best and take care.